The Lord be with you. Pastor Moak here, Zion Evangelical Lutheran Church. Today's catechetical lesson is going to be, if you have a syllabus and you're following along, class or lesson number 20. And with that said, we are also going to include what was part of a part two of lesson 19. So lesson 19, in a normal year, we have a test. And then after the test is over, this is the only class of the year, we have a little bit of class afterwards where I introduce prayer. We are going to combine those two. So lesson 20, we are going to be uh, going uh, through pages 174 to 189 in the small catechism, if you have uh, the 1991 or 92 catechism. Um, and this is one of those lessons that I think is one of the most important ones. If you've been a Christian your whole life, you've been praying the Lord's Prayer your entire life. And this is one of those lessons uh, that, especially if you were catechized when you were younger, this is going to uh, broaden your view and understanding of the Lord's Prayer to really help you focus on what you are petitioning our Lord with each petition of the Lord's Prayer. Okay, uh, with that said, let's turn to page 32 and begin our class as we always do. And by the way, before you click fast forward and just skip ahead, uh, remember that this the reason why we do this is, in, is especially to get us focused on our devotional life. And so we are having prayer here. Don't fast forward. Don't skip ahead. Actually go through this prayer together with me. And the hope is, is that not, you not only do this uh, when you're following this lesson, but that you do this every day when you wake up. Because what does page 32 say? In the morning, when you get up, make the sign of the Holy Cross and say, In the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit. Amen. Then kneeling or standing, repeat the creed. Uh, so I'm not going to kneel or stand. If I stand, I'm going to be above the camera. If I kneel, you won't see me at all. Um, but if I were doing this not on a YouTube video, that's what we should do. And why? Not because the Lord commands us that we stand or that we kneel, but that it gets us in the mind frame of, hey, what am I doing? I'm petitioning the king of the universe. And I have thoughts and, and, and concerns that are on my heart that I want to bring to him. And so it just helps us get in the mindset that, yes, this Lord, this Heavenly Father, this King of the Universe is actually hearing our prayers. Okay, so let's confess the creed. We confess the creed. We acknowledge who God is. I believe in God the Father Almighty, maker of heaven and earth, and in Jesus Christ, his only Son, our Lord, who was conceived by the Holy Spirit, born of the Virgin Mary, suffered under Pontius Pilate, was crucified, died, and was buried. He descended into hell. The third day he rose again from the dead. He ascended into heaven and sits at the right hand of God the Father Almighty. From thence he will come to judge the living and the dead. I believe in the Holy Spirit, the Holy Christian Church, the communion of saints, the forgiveness of sins, the resurrection of the body, and the life everlasting. Amen. Let's pray the Lord's Prayer together. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our trespasses as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom, and the power, and the glory, forever and ever. Amen. In Luther's morning prayer, I thank thee, my heavenly Father, through Jesus Christ, your dear Son, that you have kept me this night from all harm and danger. And I pray that you would keep me this day also from sin and every evil, that all my doings in life may please you. For into your hands I commend myself, my body and soul, and all things. Let your holy angel be with me, that the evil foe may have no power over me. Amen. Okay, now we are not going to sing a hymn at this point. We will be singing a few verses of that hymn 766, Our Father, Who from Heaven Above, which we sung a lot in the earlier portions of our catechesis class before we got to the creed section. And we are especially going to talk about them now since we are talking about the Lord's Prayer. Okay, but let's uh, turn to um, uh, page 174 in your catechism with uh, question 193. So this is on the Lord's Prayer. Question, what privilege and command does God command, does God give to those who believe in Jesus Christ? God commands and invites believers in Jesus Christ to pray. So not only is it a privilege to pray, it's a command to pray. So it's both law and gospel. Now the word privilege doesn't necessarily mean gospel, but prayer is both law and gospel. It's law because God says, hey, you need to pray to me. I want you to pray to me. That's God's will. The new man conforms, tries to conform to God's will and prays. But it's also gospel because guess what? God hears our prayers. He promises to answer them in his way and in his time. We'll learn more about that in a little bit. So prayer is one of those uh, uh, unique thing. Well, I mean, all the sacraments are that way in the sense that God commands us to be baptized. There's also a gift attached. 
God commands us to uh, have the Lord's Supper frequently, there's a gift attached. So even with the, 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 the gospel, there's always, the reason why it's the gospel is because God wants us to have these things. It's his will for us to have them. Hope that makes sense. But let's look at uh, uh, Bible verse 685. You can just start it. You don't need to memorize it. 1 Thessalonians 5, 16, 18. Rejoice always. Pray without ceasing. Give thanks in all circumstances, for this is the will of God in Christ Jesus for you. And then look at that Bible verse right above it. Ask, and it will be given to you. Seek, and you will find. Knock, and it will be opened to you. For everyone who asks, receives. And one who seeks, finds. And to the one who knocks, it will be opened. This is the encouragement side of prayer. The, the, the sacramental side, that God actually will hear our prayers and answer them according to his way and according to his time. So what is prayer? Prayer, this is question 194, is speaking to God in words and thoughts. Underline the word speaking to God. So prayer is speaking to God. If we are talking to him, we're praying. That's what we are doing all the time. Even if it's not formal, even if, even if it is not with our hands folded and our, uh, our hands folded, our head bowed down and our eyes closed, as we so often are taught and teach uh, our kids uh, how to pray. Okay, so speaking to God. Now at the bottom of the page, 174, I want you to write in, you know, in quotes, heart-to-heart -heart talk with God. It's a heart-to-heart -heart talk with God. It doesn't have to be formal. It doesn't have to be perfect. Talk to God. Just speak to him. He wants to hear from you. We, we, I know we've done this in, in, Bible, in Bible classes past, but it is just like a, an earthly parent um, who loves to hear from their kids. Now, if you're a kid and watching this, this is an exhortation to you. Uh, call up your grandma and grandpa. Say hi to them. When you go to college, make sure you check in with your mom and dad. They want, especially your mom, they want to hear from you. She wants to hear from you. Parents love to hear from their kids. Even when you're adults, make sure you make an effort. Remember the fourth commandment, honor your father and mother. It's a whole lifelong thing. Continue to honor them until they get to go uh, to heaven to be with Jesus. Um, so just as earthly parents and earthly grandparents love to hear from their kids and grandparent, grandkids, so much more does our Heavenly Father love to hear from us. And so I like to think of it as a heart-to-heart -heart talk with God, which, by the way, is the way I was taught it. It's because there's times where you just pour your heart out to him. Even if it's something that you might not think God wants to hear. Listen, he knows what's on your heart already, so you might as well just be honest and let him know what it is. And if you're sinning while doing it, repent too. It's okay to repent. Remember, repent is a good thing. Repentance is acknowledging that we're sinners. God just wants us to acknowledge that we're the sinners and he's the one who's holy who forgives the sins. So it's a, it's a blessing, okay? All right. So uh, here is a model that I always teach the kids. Uh, this I inherited this at Zion, and I think it's a good model. I was not taught this myself, but I think it's a really good model in light of what we learn in the Lord's Prayer. And you can either write it at the top of page 174 if you have small handwriting, or you can put it in the front of the book. Uh, so we got your sanctification, justification. Here's your prayer model. And I, again, I also have this written here up at the top in case that, uh, you wanted to write it there. But the acronym is ACTS. Remember, an acronym is something where each letter that's, that spells uh, an English word like ACTS, A-C-T-S, stands uh, the first letter of each, uh, or the, each letter stands for the first letter of another word. So the, word, uh, the acronym ACTS, uh, the A is address. So we have to address our prayers to somebody. Just like if we're writing a letter to someone, we say, you know, dear, dear Susie, or dear mom, or dear dad, uh, gracious heavenly father, so we address the one who we are, whom we are speaking to, whom we are praying to. So we have this address. And think of it in the Lord's Prayer. How do we start the Lord's Prayer? Our Father. Now what comes after that? We have a clause. So there's your C, a clause. Who art in heaven? Now another way you can think of the C, besides clause, is you could say a confession. It's a confession of faith. The reason I don't teach it as confession is because when kids hear the word confession, learn the word confession, they think of it as a confession of sin. Okay, so it, it is not, doesn't have to be a confession of sin. It's a confession about who God is. So it's a clause describing God, our Heavenly Father. So think of it in the Lord's Prayer. Our Father, who art in heaven. Another way, our Father, who heals all things, who heals all diseases. Our Father, who gives us uh, his word that saves us. Um, our Father, who makes abundant promises in Christ Jesus. Our Father, dear gracious Heavenly Father, who abounds uh, in steadfast love and is slow to anger. All these things that talk about who God is. So that way, we are making this acknowledgement that whom we are speaking to is the king of the universe. You could say that one. Our Father, who, who art the king of the universe. You know, something like that. It's saying something about God um, that gives him some glory and praise um, as we beseech him. Just like we would with a, with, with, a, with an earthly king or an earthly president. Um, we, as, as talking to them, we would, uh, especially if we had something urgent, 
that we wanted them to hear. And now, by the way, God is not appeased by this, so don't, get, don't make this mistake. Uh, God is not appeased by us uh, building him up or puffing him up or, or building him up or glorifying him or praising him. That's not what I'm saying at all. But in, in, in case of an earthly king, or think of your, your children, or if you are a kid, when you, do, when you really want something from mom or dad, right? You go, to, hey, mom, I love you so much. You're, 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 you're the best. Can I please have this? I mean, we, we, we tend to butter people up, right? Now, we don't do this uh, for the sake of, of gloating as if it will earn or merit us, us something or favor with God. Not at all. Absolutely not. I'm not. That's not what I'm saying. But it is something to give God our glory and praise. This is keeping the second commandment. So by doing this, remember what the second commandment is? You shall not misuse the name of the Lord your God. What does this mean? We should fear and love God so we do not curse, swear, you satanic arts, liar, deceive by his name, but call upon in every trouble, pray, praise, and give thanks. So by speaking this clause, we are giving God our praise. Okay? And that's just something we should do as Christians. All right, so we got the address, A. We got the C. We got the clause. T, here's where we have our thanksgiving. Now, someone might say, well, you know, there's no thanksgiving in any of the petitions of the Lord's Prayer. Because all these petitions are petitions. We are supplicating our Heavenly Father to give us something, so to speak. Hallowed be thy name. Your kingdom come. Your will be done. Give us this day our daily bread. Forgive us our trespasses. Lead us not into temptation. Deliver us from evil. All those things are asking God uh, to do something. However, and we're going to learn more about this in a minute, every single petition, God answers without our prayer. So by saying, hallowed be thy name, we are essentially saying, thank you, Lord, for your name being holy. Thank you, Lord, that your kingdom comes to us in word and sacrament. Thank you, Lord, that your will is done on earth. Otherwise, this place would be a, a complete catastrophe, a complete mess. God preserves all things. We confess that in the creed, right? So each petition is inherently a thanksgiving. There's one there. Okay, so you got your address, A, C, your clause, T, your thanksgiving, and now you've got your S, so your supplications, and those, are, of course, are your actual petitions. So in a prayer, in the, according to the model, if I was just praying for this class, I would say, Gracious Heavenly Father, who has given us your word to study, Thank you, Lord, for your word, which promises to save us and increase our faith. And gracious Heavenly Father, as we study your word, please be faithful to be. See, I'm, I'm messing up now. This is okay. It's okay to mess up a prayer. We trust that you are faithful to your promise. So please increase our faith as we study your word. And then end the prayer with, in Jesus' name, amen. See, I'm glad I made that mistake because then you get to see, look, pastors make mistakes too. Uh, pastors fumble over their words. I'm a babbling idiot nine times out of ten. And that's okay. Because we're God's idiot. I had a pastor tell me that one time when I told him I was afraid to speak up at a pastor's conference. I said, you know, man, I'm just afraid to sound like an idiot. He said, you are an idiot, but you're God's idiot. And that was incredibly comforting to me. We're all idiots, right? We all fall short of the glory of God. We're all sinners who are in need of God's grace and forgiveness. So just talk to him. It's okay. It's okay to make mistakes. The Holy Spirit's going to intercede for us. We're going to head of ourselves. But we'll learn more about that in just a little bit. Okay, so we've got your acronym address. Clause, Thanksgiving, Supplication, ACTS, and then end it with, in Jesus' name, Amen. Okay, uh, let's keep going. Look, top of page 175, question 686. Circle this one. Psalm 19, verse 14. You may even have heard a pastor open a sermon with these words. Let the words of my mouth and the meditation of my heart be acceptable in your sight, O Lord, my rock and my redeemer. Wonderful uh, words uh, to put on our hearts every day. We could pray this every day. I mean, think about everything that we do. Let the words of my mouth and the meditation of my heart be pleasing in your sight, O Lord, my God, my rock and my redeemer. Whether we're preaching like a pastor, or we're just going to work, whatever it may be, or maybe we're staying home with the kids. What a great way to start your day in prayer. Let the words of my mouth and the meditation of my heart be pleasing in your sight or acceptable. I can't remember how the ESV does it. Uh, I learned it as pleasing. Um, either way, that's a wonderful petition that everything that we do think and say, we're asking God, help it to be pleasing to you. Oh man, the world would be a better place if that was if that was the four, foremost goal of every single day. That we could reflect uh, Christ in everything that we do and everything that we say to one another. Okay, uh, let's go to question 195. To whom should we pray? We should pray to the true God only, Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. Not to idols, saints, or anything God has created. Because anything that is created is not God. Because God is uncreated. God is eternal. Without beginning, without end, if you remember the attributes of God. Okay, so, uh, now where do I have this? I don't want to get ahead of myself. Um, 
I don't know if I had this written down here, but either way, uh, notice it says, we pray to God, true God only, Father, Son, Holy Spirit. I don't think I have it written in the Catechism, but this is reminding me that this should be here. So at the bottom of page 175, this may come up again. I'm going to apologize if I repeat it again, but I want to make sure you get it. So this is the way I teach it to the kids. In, in, in the Lord's Prayer, we pray to God the Father. We pray in the name of God the Son. We pray with the help of the Holy Spirit. Now, this doesn't mean that you can't pray to God the Son or you can't pray to God the Holy Spirit because they're all three persons are one God. Okay, But this is just helpful in, 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 uh, in, in our understanding of prayer that as the Lord's Prayer has this, this uh, opening address, we pray to God the Father. And we always end our prayers in the name of God the Son because it is because of Jesus that we can pray to God. So we pray to God the Father in the name of God the Son and in this most comforting assurance that we pray with the help of the Holy Spirit. When we pray in faith, the Holy Spirit is always there helping us pray. He's making intercession uh, for us. He's help, he's, he helps us. Okay, So this is comforting to us. Uh, so I would write that at the bottom of page 175. We pray in the, uh, to God the Father, in the name of God the Son, with the help of God the Holy Spirit. With the understanding that you can pray to all three uh, persons, even one, even as one, because all three persons are one God, even if you want to pray to God the Holy Spirit. We have hymns like that. To God the Holy Spirit, let us pray. We did that one, I think, a couple classes ago. Um, that's one of our hymns. All right. Hopefully I said that right. Uh, we don't want to make Trinitarian heresy. That would be uh, utmost blasphemy. Uh, but remember, all three persons, one God. So you can pray to uh, all, all three persons. Um, when you pray to one, you are praying to all three because all three are one God. Okay, that I might. When you're praying to Jesus, you're praying to the, the, the second person of Trinity. But you're praying to the one God. Make sense? So when you're praying to one of the persons, you are praying to God. There, I said it right that time. Oh, man, you're going to. You're going to string me up and, and lynch me for uh, for heresy. i got to be careful here. And I take that serious. I, I, I kind of said that flippantly. But I do take uh, pure doctrine seriously. And we're going to see this in just a second with one of the petitions. So, question 196. Oh, this is going to be a long uh, study if I don't keep moving. 196, page 176. Whose prayers are acceptable to God? Only those who believe in Jesus Christ may pray to God and expect to be heard. Underline the words, only those who believe. So, it's important that we actually believe in God and we don't just uh, spew out these, these words and just, you know, we send them out to the universe and hope someone uh, does something with them and actually causes things to happen. It's kind of like on Facebook. Oh, this is so annoying. Or social media. When you have things like send good thoughts, you know, so, so a person's way. What the heck does that mean? And what, what, what does sending good thoughts do to anybody? I mean, it's that, honestly, it's the lamest thing ever. You want to do something for me? Pray for me. And trust that God will actually hear my prayer. And same thing for you. Uh, uh, good, good thoughts, man. You know, sending good vibes. I'm not a hippie. What does that even mean? God the Father wants to us to talk to Him and actually ask Him for things and trust that He can actually do them. Okay, so don't send good thoughts. Super lame. Pray for the person. To God the Father in the name of God the Son with the help of the Holy Spirit. All right, let's keep going. Question 197. What should be the content of our prayers? In our prayers, we should ask for everything that tends to the glory of God and to our own and our neighbor's welfare, both spiritual and bodily blessings. We should also praise and thank God for who he is and what he has done. And I have the ACTS acronym on, on the side margin here. I just have ACTS. And I say C front cover or page 174, which is where I had you write it. Um, but this is our reminder of, of that, that kind of that model. Let's keep going. How should we pray? Uh oh. Oh no. Never mind. We're good. How should we pray? Uh, question 198. We should pray, A, in the name of Jesus, that is, with faith in him as our Redeemer. Qu uh, look up Bible verse 697, James 1, 6-7. Let him ask in faith, with no doubting. For the one who doubts is like a wave of the sea that is driven and tossed by the wind. But that person must not suppose that he will receive anything from the Lord. So ask in faith, don't doubt. And we're going we're gonna to talk about how doubt plays a role um, in prayer, when we get to the article on the forgiveness of sins, like forgive us our trespasses as we forgive those who trespass against us, uh, and we'll, that, that, that's going to be the major theme of that petition. We'll get to that, though. Not this class, but next one. Uh, C. Did I skip B? Well, either way, C. According to God's revealed will. Uh, so, again, we pray in the name of Jesus with faith. We pray with confidence, and we pray according to God's revealed will. In other words, what this is a reminder to us is that we shouldn't pray for something that we know God reveals as sinful or evil. Uh, so we don't want to, or and we don't want to pray um, that God revealed His secret will to us, uh, meaning the things that we don't have answers to. 
All right, let's keep going. Question 199. Who helps us pray? God the Holy Spirit prays with and for us. <clears throat> so, you saw in the last question that we pray in the name of Jesus. Here, uh, who helps us pray? God the Holy Spirit prays with and for us. So underline the words, Holy Spirit prays with and for us. And here's where you get that kind of, that uh, that triune breakdown of, of what I said to you on, uh, to, to write on page 175, that we pray to God the Father in the name of God the Son with the help of the Holy Spirit. Let's look at, uh, let's put a star next to Bible verse uh, 702, Romans 8:26. Likewise, the Spirit helps us in our weakness. For we do not know what to pray for as we ought, but the Spirit himself intercedes for us with groanings too deep for words. Oh, this is, again, so comforting that when we pray, when we, when we babble, when we fumble over our words, there the Holy Spirit is interceding for us with groanings too deep for words. That's so rich because, again, um, whatever the Holy Spirit is doing on behalf of us, it can't be expressed in human words. And this is a reminder to us of the divine nature uh, of, 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 of the essence, the divine essence of our God and, and uh, the third person of the, of the Trinity, the Holy Spirit, intercedes for us with groanings too deep for words. Question 200. How does God answer prayer? God hears the prayers of all Christians and answers in his own way and at his own time. You've heard me say that a couple times already today. This is a reminder to us that sometimes God does say no. And it's amazing to me how young children um, get really, really upset when their parents tell them no. In fact, a lot of times it's easier for the parents just to say yes. But then your kid will grow up and be spoiled and, and a terrible human being because they will think that everyone always has to do what they want. But sometimes, and actually more often than not, when the parent says no, they're trying to teach the kid, hey, this might not be good for you. And that's a really hard lesson for a little kid to learn. I know this because I've got you know four of them in my house right now who cannot handle being told no. Uh, and, and no one can. And you know what? It doesn't change in adults. So the temper tantrums change. Uh, once, we become, once we become adults. But we don't like being told no. We don't like being told we can't have what we want. You know, what is that? Uh, you can't always get what you want. Is that the Rolling Stones? I, I don't remember my bands uh, from back then. Um, but, you know, it, it's true though. We can't always get what we want. And the reminder to us is God's not being a spiteful, mean parent. Sometimes as parents, we say no to spite our kids. Oh, that's a sin. Parents, fathers, don't provoke your kids to anger. But in the case of the Heavenly Father, he can't sin. So when he tells us no, we should joyfully say, Thanks be to God, you are doing what is best for me. You know better than I do, O Lord. Uh, how dare the clay say to the potter, Why have you made me? Right, Jeremiah or Isaiah? Someone in the Old Testament. You get the point, though. So God's saying no. And yes, sometimes we get more no's than we get yes's. Uh, but it's, it, it, we, should, we should embrace the no's as thanks be to God, he knows what's best. Just like an earthly parent, when they're doing their job, when they say no, it's what's best for the kid. All right? But either way, God answers every prayer. It might be yes, might be no. It might not, it might be not yet. That's another one too. I teach this to the kids all the time. When I was a kid, from age like five or six, I'm talking about the original Nintendo here. I prayed for a Nintendo every single Christmas. I just wanted to have Nintendo. All the other kids had video games. I never had video games. Prayed for Nintendo. Prayed, 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 prayed all the time. Never got it. Parents didn't think it was good for me. Thanks be to God. That was a good decision. Video games are no good. Well, what good are they? Seriously. Sorry if I'm offending you. Sorry, not sorry. They're just no good for anybody. It causes us to sit. It causes us to be lazy. Go out and do something with your hands. Have li uh, good, Do good work. Do good labor. Okay, either way. I go away to college. Get a phone call in my dorm room. My mom says, hey, guess what? The Corby family, my mom is a child care provider, uh, they gave us a Nintendo and about 120 video games. And I thought, are you kidding me? I move out of the house and that's when we get... We get, we get Nintendo. Once I'm gone, it doesn't matter anymore. Well, sure enough, couldn't wait to get home the first time I got home. Put on Mario. I beat Mario. Put on Duck Hunter. Set up a little blind in the basement. Played some Duck Hunter. Uh, beat Mario 3. And I thought, well, that's about it. So well, That's all I ever wanted to do with the video games. Now, if I was a kid, it probably would have taken me years to figure out how to do that. But as an adult, I could you know kind of figure it out. I had more coordination with my hands. But I thought, huh, well, God answered this prayer, but man, I totally didn't need it. But that's what it reminded me of. But, the, but this verse is what this reminds me of. God answers in his own way and at his own time. So no, all those years, well, then you got, what you, you got what you asked for. But look, now that you're an adult, you realize it's really not that big of a deal. It's really not that important. So it's a reminder to us that, hey, God knows. God knows what's best. All right, let's keep going. Question 201. I wonder how many people stopped listening after I made fun of video games. I shouldn't say I made fun of them. Uh, but just show show a, show the rightful place in things. Uh, question 201. For whom should we pray? 
We should pray for ourselves and for all other people, even for our enemies, but not for the souls of the dead. So who should we pray for? Everyone, including our enemies. Uh, this is important because who wants to pray for their enemies? Who wants our enemies to succeed? Who wants our enemies to have good things? Well, what are we praying for when we pray for our enemies? Ultimately, that they would believe in Jesus, repent of their sin, and trust in Jesus for forgiveness. Question 202. Okay, I'm feeling really convicted here. I'm sorry for, for coming across as harsh about the video game thing. There are some positive things about it, especially if you're playing with friends. There's, you can develop a community network. You can develop some friendships. But, other, but overall, when we have our hobbies, we should really think about, are they able to serve our neighbor? In what way can we benefit? Or how is this, uh, think of Paul when he says, uh, physical training is of some value, but godliness is of value in every way. So there are some things that are good for us. It's good to take care of our body. We should be good stewards of it. But in the case of video games, my point was, is that we tend to just sit and just stare at a screen for a long time, which doesn't help our body, and it doesn't help us grow, and it doesn't help us in, in, in any way. That's what I was saying. So I repent if I came across as harsh or unloving. Okay. Question 202. Where should we pray? We should pray everywhere, especially when we are alone with our families and in church. Now, look at Bible verse uh, 709, Matthew 6, 6. When you pray, go into your room and shut the door and pray to your father who is in secret. And your father who sees in secret will reward you. Now, what this means is, now Jesus tells us to go in secret to pray. Uh, if the temptation is for us to pray in front of other people as if we can gloat about how good we are at praying. So, so Jesus' point when he's teaching this is, you know, go pray in a closed, closed room. That's going to be more beneficial to you. It's not beneficial to you if, if someone says, oh, wow, that is such a great prayer, Pastor. That's such a great prayer, parishioner. Oh, you're so good at praying. That doesn't benefit anyone. That, that, that benefits you. You know, it edifies you. It puffs you up. So Jesus' point is, this, go pray in secret. Now, what this doesn't mean is, is only pray in secret. And this is where, this is a Lutheran uh, video where I'm going to call out Lutherans here. We are so bad at praying for each other face to face. We're great at saying, I'll pray for you. We're not good at saying, let's pray right now. And we should be comfortable to do that. Again, who cares if you're a babbling idiot? You're God's idiot, right? We said that at the beginning of the video. Who cares if you don't say things perfectly or rightly? I mean, okay, I shouldn't say who cares. Yes, we want to make sure we say prayers in the right way. I mean, we don't want to be flippant about not caring. But what I mean is this, don't let that burden you from not doing it. Don't let it constrict your conscience, restrict your conscience from saying, man, you see someone who's in need, say, hey, can I pray for you? You, know, you got surgery tomorrow. Hey, let's have a quick prayer now. And it can be quick. But you know how encouraging that is to someone to say, wow, they're not afraid to pray for me. Here, even in the midst of some other people listening. No, they're not doing it to show off. And if, the, and if it is the case, the, the, repent, the repentance is, is necessary for them. But again, we should be build, bearing each other's burdens and praying for each other. All right, don't want to rant too long. Oh, Got to keep going. When should we pray? We should pray regularly. This is question 203. And frequently, especially in time of trouble. Circa Bible verse 716. You only got to memorize the first three words here. Pray without ceasing. Now what this doesn't mean is that we should do nothing but pray. Because then we would neglect all our vocations. So in other words, there's times where I have to be preaching. You know, preaching to people. There's times I have to be teaching Bible study. Well, I can't say, well, I can't teach Bible study because i got to pray. That's all I'm allowed to do. I mean, we know that that's silly, right? So when it says pray without ceasing, what it means is everything you do... Do it in prayer. So really, what we should do every time we get in the car. Heavenly Father, thank you for this car. Please bless me with safe travels. I mean, quick. I mean, that doesn't even have to be that formal. Lord, bless me with safe travel. That's a prayer. Talk to God. Every, Lord, uh, I'm on my way to work. Please let this be a good day. Simple. Lord, help me to be patient in school. Lord, bless me with health. Lord, I love my mom. Thank you for my mom. Whatever. Just... My, my grandpa, who, who catechized me, we used to call these bullet prayers, where we just send quick, quick bullets up to the Heavenly Father. And this isn't a violent illustration. Just a, like a bullet goes really fast, a quick prayer up to heaven. Um, let's say you're in the middle of it. Also, you're about to have a car accident. You know, you see it happening. Oh, right before you, you don't got time to say, Gracious Heavenly Father, thank you. Know, we don't have time for the model. Right there at a time, well, you got the Kyrie. Lord, have mercy. Man, three words. You can say it so fast. Lord, have mercy. Christ, have mercy. Lord, have mercy. You pray the Kyrie, boom. You're talking to God. That's a prayer. And God hears that when, when, when we pray in faith. So pray without ceasing. Everything we do, we do in prayer. All right. Question 204. What prayer did Jesus give us to show us how to pray? Obvious answer is God gave us the Lord's Prayer. Sean Lam, Baca, rest in peace. I uh, had a funeral for him oh, a year or two ago. I can't remember now. Man, it's been, it's been a while. Um, but I remember uh, making a visit to him. 
And he, uh, and I asked him if, to have a prayer with him. And, and I had a prayer and he said, Pastor, I want to pray the Lord's Prayer. Okay, okay, yeah, you're right. Because it's the perfect prayer. And he actually was catechizing me in that moment, reminding me that we should always, you know, pay, pray the Lord's Prayer. That is the most comforting prayer. Again, the human nature in us thinks, well, I have to pray something that's 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 personal, that's relatable, uh, that really drives home uh, the point that I'm here for them and I know what their need is. The Lord's Prayer does that too. So yes, I think we should pray a personal prayer. I'm not I'm not denying that. Heart to heart talk with God. Do that too. But if we're praying for someone, man, wouldn't it be great to end it with the Lord's Prayer? That way, if I'm a babbling idiot and I don't convey the point I'm supposed to convey, and by the way, I'm terrible at doing this, so I'm teaching this and I'm trying to do it better myself. Um, when we say, you know, we pray in the name of Jesus, who taught us to pray? Boom, let's all pray. Let's pray the Lord's Prayer together. That way we've covered everything. You know, maybe, you know, uh, the, the, and this has happened before. Um, I, they tell me something that they need, and in my prayer, um, you know, maybe there's five or six things, and I forgot one of them. And then when the prayer is over, they'll say, you know, Pastor, uh, you know, and make sure you pray for this too, you know. Like, and, and it's not that they understood that it was an accident. I'm, I'm, I'm a fallible human being where I left something out. But when you pray the Lord's Prayer, I could say, you know, if they say, well, Pastor, you make sure you include this. I'm like, hey, you know what? We just prayed for this in the petition. Give us this day our daily bread. And the Lord understood what, what we needed. So you could take comfort that even though I made a mistake and omitted something, Heavenly Father knows what you need. And, he, and, he, and that's what we just prayed for in the Lord's Prayer. Okay, so the Lord's Prayer, it's the perfect prayer. It's the all-inclusive prayer. Let's go into it. Introduction. 31 minutes in. Our Father who art in heaven. Our Father in heaven. What does this mean? With these words, God tenderly invites us to believe that he is our true Father and that we are his true children so that with all boldness and confidence we may ask him as dear children ask their dear Father. Oh, this is a wonderful petition. Petition. When we pray to our Heavenly Father, he is our Father because of Jesus. Right? So when Jesus was baptized, what does the Father say to him? This is my beloved Son with whom I am well pleased. Listen to him. Well, we've been baptized into Christ, right? We learned about that in the fourth part of baptism, Romans 6, 4. We have been buried, when baptized with Christ, and been buried with him into his death, nor that just as Christ has been risen from the dead, we too may walk in newness of life. So we've been buried with Christ, we've been baptized with Christ, and that means we have been adopted into the Heavenly Father through the waters of baptism, and we can call the Heavenly Father our Father, and we can have the assurance that we are his dear children. Now, if any of you, Lord willing, had a good father at home, good father growing up, you knew that uh, you could go to your father and ask him for things. And if you needed it, he'll help you. And you know what? Even if, you were, even if you're an adult watching this and your, your father, who's, and he's good dad, is still living today, you know. If you're an adult, you're my age. I, I know. I could call my dad. In fact, I won't get going back. Uh, I could call my dad right now because I, I know this to be true. I was going to go into a digression about a story that just happened. I could say, Dad, I really, I really need this. Really need help with something. He'll say, okay, uh, you know, uh, maybe I can get out there next week. And my dad lives five plus hours away. He loves, he loves me so much that I know I, and I, that I could call him anytime and he would be there to help me. God's a good dad. Thanks be to God for good fathers. So if we will go to our, our earthly fathers for the things we need, how much more should we go to our Heavenly Father for the things that we need? Again, Heavenly Father wants to hear from us. We said this in a different, uh, different lesson before that if my kids need something, I want them to come to me. I don't want them to go to the neighbor. I want them to come to me and ask me for what they need. So much more our Heavenly Father too. So we should have that assurance. This is pure gospel. Our Father who art in heaven. Pure gospel because we know he's our, he's our dad. He's our heavenly dad. And he hears our prayers. He wants to hear them. And he wants to answer them. He's going to do what's best for us. All right. Um, question 205. In what way does the word Father in the Lord's Prayer encourage us to pray? The word Father tells us that God loves us and wants us to pray to him confidently and without fear. Look at Bible verse 718. Put a star next to that one and put a star next to 720. I'm going to read this one next. See what kind of love the Father has given to us, that we should be called children of God, and so we are. The reason why the world does not know us is that it did not know Him. We're called the children, we should be called children of God, and by the waters of baptism, so we are. 2 Corinthians 6.18 I will be a father to you, and you shall be sons and daughters to me, says the Lord Almighty. Uh, praise be to God that we have that familiar relationship. This is why families are a blessing, by the way. Don't let anyone ever, ever deter you from that. Don't ever let anyone tell you that, ah, uh, you know, kids are, uh, kids are, kids are bad. You don't want to have kids. Oh, you don't want to get married and be tied down to somebody for the rest of your life. No, it's good. Why is it good? Because God instituted it. And whatever God institutes, it's good. 
right? Remember, he institutes marriage. He says, man, it's not good. It's not fit for man to be alone. And so what he does, he called a deep, caused a deep sleep to fall upon Adam. And from his side, uh, the Lord created Eve. And when Adam woke up, he says, ah, at last, bone of my bone and flesh of my flesh. It is good to be family. It is good for us. And all the sinful flesh doesn't like it. The world doesn't like it. When the world gives advice, you should throw it away if it doesn't conform to God's word. Because remember that unholy trinity, sin, death, and the power of the devil. By the way, death, you can either say death or the world, because this world is a world of death. We like death. We celebrate death. Death happens all around us. And the worst part is when we, we tend, if we ever start to think comfortable, get comfortable with death, as if, well, this is just the way it is. No, it's just the way of this world. And this world is evil and it is fallen. Thanks be to God, it's redeemed by Christ. Uh, so we have this, we have this hope. But again, sin, death, power of the devil, unholy trinity, when uh, those three things are always trying to lead us away. We're going to get to that in a different petition. But I don't want to get ahead, too far ahead of myself again. Uh, to put a star next to Bible, verse 722, top of 181. Psalm 103. It's either my favorite or my second favorite. I mean, I love Psalm 23. How can you not love Psalm 23? If it, Psalm 103, I'll put it as my second favorite psalm. Wonderful psalm. It is a wonderful psalm uh, following absolution. As far as the east is from the west so far, your transgressions have been removed from you. Wonderful reminder of the, the power of absolution that actually forgives our sins. But look at this uh, verse. As a father shows compassion to his children, so the Lord shows compassion to those who fear him. The Lord shows compassion to you. When we repent of our sin, we acknowledge in, in our humility that we are not God and that we need a Savior. Oh, the Lord shows so much compassion to us. He, he, he always tends to the brokenhearted. He never leaves us nor forsakes us. That happened to Christ on the cross. Psalm 103. You know what? Here's your homework. When you get done watching this video, pray, one psalm, pray Psalm 103 after this. And pray those words as a, as a forgiven child of God. So comforting. Uh, question 206. What does the word our impress upon us when we pray our Father? In Jesus, all believers are children of the one Father and should pray with and for one another. This is awesome. So I, I've I think I've taught this on here before. I'm not sure. Uh, when I used to pray the Lord's Prayer by myself, I used to change the pronouns from plurals to singulars. So I, instead of saying, Our Father, I would say, My Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be your name. Your kingdom come, your will be done. Uh, give me this day my daily bread. Forgive me my trespasses. And, uh, and I, Because what I wanted to do is I wanted to focus on the fact that I was praying it. And uh, it helped, it just, for whatever reason, because I had done the other way my entire life, uh, it helped me focus on the petitions. But someone pointed out to me, uh, that when we pray the Lord's Prayer, and it's here from the Catechism, so this isn't just someone's idea, this is what the Catechism teaches us, that when, whenever I pray the Lord's Prayer, I'm praying for everybody and with everybody. And so even when I'm praying the Lord's Prayer by myself, I'm praying it with the whole Church of God. And that is incredibly comforting to know I'm not alone. So in those words, our Father, I'm never alone. I'm praying with the entire Church. That, again, is comforting because that's what heaven is going to be like. There's no such thing as in my own... No one has their own island in heaven. No one has their own castle where they can go off and just you know be by themselves. We are the communion, the communion of saints. We are the Christian church. We are meant to be together. And so when we pray that Lord's prayer, we are praying. So whenever someone says, you know, Pastor, pray for me, and if I forget, when I the moment I say, Our Father who art in heaven, I'm not only praying with that person, whatever their need was, I'm praying with them and I'm praying for them. So again, one of you says, Pastor, you're going to pray for me. P please put this on the prayer chain, and I forget. Uh, I'm never done on purpose. And let's say I forget, because again, I'm fallible. Uh, I'm a sinful human being. The moment we pray, Our Father who art in heaven, wherever it is, whenever it is, I'm praying with you and for you. So while you're praying at home, I'm praying with you too. And vice versa, you're praying for me when you pray those words. Oh, isn't that so comforting? It should be so comforting, so, so encouraging. Man, I'm getting fired up. I need to tone it down. Here's where I need, here's, Tone it down. Settle down. Okay. 206. Oh, I already did 206. 207. What do the words, who art in heaven, say about God? Answer. These words assure us that our Heavenly Father, as Lord over all, has the power to grant our prayers. Circle Bible, verse 727. Luke 1, 37. Nothing will be impossible with God. Nothing. And this is so hard for us, especially if, so hard for us to believe, especially if we've got a loved one in the hospital, and, uh, you know, they, they, they seem to be okay. And the doctor says, well, they're not going to leave. They're, they're, they're going to die. Or, or the prognosis is so bad. they got one, one, two weeks to live. We put so much fear, love, and trust in what the doctor says that we forget God is still in charge. 
God is the author of life. He decides who is created. He decides when to take that life home, either to heaven or, or to hell. Uh, he, don't read into that. What I mean is, is God gets to decide when someone dies. Because I didn't want to say that, I didn't want to make the impression that all people go to heaven. So don't think that God is a, an, uh, an unloving God. God wants all people to come to heaven. But how do we get there? By repentance and faith in Jesus for the forgiveness of sins. So it's not God's fault if someone goes to hell. That's that's their own doing, right? We ta we learned this already. Okay. So this is where I wish I had an edit button. I could just like say, stop, take that part out so I don't waste 35 of your seconds. Let's keep going though. So with God, all things are possible. Um, don't ever doubt God's God's love and his power and his wisdom. And again, he has control over these things, not us. Now, this doesn't mean we shouldn't listen to the doctor. We shouldn't say, well, doctor, you don't know any better. You don't know my, my, my mom or dad or loved one's going to die within three days. You don't know that. Okay, I'm not saying they don't have sanctified reason. I'm just saying don't put your fear, love, and trust in their words. Listen to what they say and, and listen to their wisdom. They might be right. But when you pray, don't say, well, Lord, my... My loved one's already going to die because the doctor said so. Lord, my loved one's life is in your hands. Thank you for the wisdom of the medical field and the doctor. But I look to you ultimately and alone for what is good. See, see the distinction I'm making? Okay. Let's go to the first petition. Now, for the first three petitions, there, are going to be a, there is going to be a twofold how each of these petitions are kept. I don't have you memorize all of the the, uh, the definitions, but I do make you memorize this twofold how of these first three petitions, and you'll you'll understand why in a second. So let's read it together. Hallowed be thy name. What does this mean? God's name is certainly holy in itself, but we pray in this petition that it may be kept holy among us also. So, how is God's name kept holy? God's name is kept holy. Underline these words here. When the word of God is taught in its truth and purity, and we, okay, you can stop underlining, as the children of God, now start underlining again, also lead holy lives according to it. Help us to do this, dear Father in heaven. But anyone who teaches or lives contrary to God's word profanes the name of God among us. Protect us from this, Heavenly Father. So what is it? Uh, on the side here, I wrote twofold how. And you can see what I underline once again. So when the word of God is taught in its truth and purity among us, and we lead holy lives according to it. Yeah, it's so blurry. Sorry about that. So the twofold how of hallowed be thy name. When the word of God is taught in its truth and purity, how this happens? When we, when we lead holy lives according to it. So what you're praying for when you pray hallowed be thy name. You are praying for your pastor that he preaches and teaches God's word rightly among you. And you're also praying for yourself that you would lead a holy life according to God's word. And that's how you and we keep God's name holy. How we keep God's name holy. Notice we don't, how we don't make God's name holy. His name's holy apart from our prayer. That's what we said on the first part of this petition. But when we pray, hallowed be thy name, we're praying, Lord, give us faithful pastors that will preach your word, even if I don't like it. Preach you the word and plant it home to men who like or like it not. Oh my goodness, I'm forgetting the words. Preach you the word and plant it home to men who like or like it not. The word that shall endure and stand when flowers and men shall be for God. So we have to preach the word whether we like it or not, whether men like it or not. Right? Uh, and so when you pray, again, hallowed be the name, you're praying for your pastor. You're praying for all pastors. You're praying for all people who, who proclaim God's. You're praying for parents that they would teach their kids uh, the word of God rightly at home. And also that we all would lead holy lives according to it. Because the way we keep God's name holy among us is when we try to live lives according to God's word. So isn't that, see how, see how all-inclusive hallowed be thy name is? Let God, let your name be holy among us. In what is taught and what is learned and what is lived. All right. Uh, question 208. What is the connection between this petition and the second commandment? Well, what's the second commandment? You shall not misuse the name of the Lord your God. What does this mean? We should fear and love God so we do not curse, swear you satanic arts, lie or deceive by his name, but call upon in every trouble, pray, praise, and give thanks. So lying or deceiving by God's name would not be keeping God's name holy. How do we keep God's name holy? In our, when we call upon it whenever we're in trouble, when we're praying, when we're praising, when we're giving thanks. Uh, look at, uh, I'll read the answer here. Both speak about the name of God. Underline that. 
That's the connection between the petition and the second commandment. Here's a quote from the large catechism. In this petition, we pray for exactly what God demands in the second commandment. We pray that his name not be taken in vain, but be used well for God's praise and honor. Circa Bible, verse 729, Exodus 27, You shall not take the name of the Lord your God in vain, for the Lord will not hold him guiltless who takes his name in vain. Now, when you learn, this is the second commandment. When you learn the second commandment, you just learn the first part up to the comma. Well, and we learned it a little differently. You shall not misuse the name of the Lord your God. The old way, you shall not take the name of the Lord your God in vain. I prefer that way, but no one knows what in vain means anymore, so that's why they updated it. Uh, I would say we should just teach what it means, but I'm ranting, so I'll stop. But that second half is a reminder to us that the Lord will not hold him guiltless who takes his name in vain. So we need to repent when we do take God's name in vain or when we misuse it. All right, question 209. What are we asking when we pray that God's name be made holy? Since God's name is God as he has revealed himself to us, we cannot make his name holy. We already said this. But we do pray that he would help us keep his name holy in our lives. Again, we've already talked about that. We can't make God's name holy, but we can keep his name holy. All right. Uh, how do we keep God's name holy? We keep God's name holy, A, when God's word is taught among us in his truth and purity. So, uh, put a star next to Bible verse 731. You don't have to memorize it. Jeremiah 23, let him who has my word speak my word faithfully. This is the charge of, of pastors or all people who have a vocation where they are to teach, like parents to their children. B, when we live according to the word of God. Put a star next to Bible verse 733. This is from the Sermon on the Mount. Jesus says, let your light shine before others so that they may see your good works and give glory to your Father who is in heaven. All right, question 211. How is God's name profaned? God's name is profaned, that is dishonored, A, when anyone teaches contrary to God's word, B, when anyone lives contrary to God's word. So again, you see this twofold how here in the last few questions. What is the twofold how of hallowed be the name? When the word of God is taught in its truth and purity, and when we lead holy lives according to it. Twofold how of this petition. You, again, you've seen it in these last three questions here. Uh, there's an A and a B. There's an A and a B. The uh, last two questions, I guess. All right, let's go to the second petition. Thy kingdom come. Your kingdom come, what does this mean? The king, top of 184. Let's read it together. The kingdom of God certainly comes by itself without our prayer, but we pray in this petition that it may come to us also. Now, how does God's kingdom come? So again, just like God's name is hallowed, holy without our prayer, so God's kingdom comes without our prayer. But how does it come? God's kingdom comes when our Heavenly Father gives us his Holy Spirit so that by his grace we believe his holy word and lead godly lives here in time and there in eternity. So notice the second part of the twofold how is once again that we lead holy lives. The first part of this one is we believe. So underline, we believe his holy word and lead godly lives. So underline those words, we believe his holy word and lead godly lives. Again, twofold how. The twofold how of God's kingdom comes among us. So God's kingdom is present. So it's like church on Sunday. This is the easiest way to think about it. Church is on Sunday. There's church whether you're there or not. So when you pray that kingdom come, you're praying that God's kingdom would come in my heart and in my life. And that means I go to church because that's where God's kingdom is. Because that's where the, his word is being taught and, and, and professed and distributed in word and sacrament. So we believe his holy word and lead godly lives, and that's how God's kingdom comes among us. Make sense? Okay. Now, question two and two. This gets a little confusing. I don't test on this because I don't think this is the most important distinction you need to know. But it's important for you to, to understand so when you're reading the Bible, uh, you don't think that the kingdom of God is just word and sacrament, for example. So, what is the kingdom of God? The kingdom of God is his ruling as king over the whole universe. Underline the words kingdom of power. The church on earth, kingdom of grace, there's your word and sacrament. And the church and angels in heaven, kingdom of glory. So underline kingdom of power, kingdom of grace, kingdom of glory. It's the three things that are in parentheses. And next to this, write three kingdoms. And, I, and again, sometimes side merges, it just helps you find things. If you're flipping through a book, you can find them quickly. Now, I put a star next to all three Bible verses. All three Bible verses describe one of these three kingdoms. So look at Psalm 103, that awesome psalm again. The Lord, my second favorite psalm. The Lord has established his throne in the heavens and his kingdom rules over all. That's a kingdom of power because God's king rules over all. Think of uh, the hymn, Beautiful Savior. Beautiful Savior, King of creation. And then in the last verse, 
Um, Lord of the nations. So we got king of creation, Lord of the nations. That's a kingdom of power. All right, John 3, 5. Jesus answered, Truly, truly, I say to you, unless one is born of water and the Spirit, he cannot enter the kingdom of God. Now we, when we did baptism, learned that this is a baptismal verse. That's a kingdom of grace. So how does one enter the kingdom of God? Through the means of grace, through the waters of baptism. So again, if you're reading John 3, that, that's not a kingdom of power. Uh, that is talking about how one enters the kingdom of God, and it's through the means of grace, through baptism, kingdom of grace. Now, kingdom of glory. Uh, 2 Timothy 4.18, The Lord will rescue me from every evil deed and bring me safely into his heavenly kingdom. To him be the glory forever and ever. Amen. That's a kingdom of glory, referring to the heavenly kingdom, where the departed saints already are, and where we will be uh, whenever the Lord calls us home, or if he comes again first to judge the living and the dead. Um, that's the kingdom of glory, okay? So again, just helpful when, we're, when we see this, this heavenly kingdom language or this kingdom of God language. Uh, it's just sometimes helpful to categorize, but I don't make you memorize it. Okay, question two and three. For what do we pray in the second petition? We do not pray that God's kingdom of power would come because that is already present everywhere. So in other words, when we say thy kingdom come, we're not asking for the king, for, for the, for, we're not asking for God to be king of creation or the Lord of the nations because he already is that. Okay? But we ask God, A, give us his Holy Spirit so that we believe his word and lead godly lives as members of his kingdom of grace. That's that twofold how, that we believe his word and we lead godly lives. Circa Bible verse 740 on the top of 185, and you only have to memorize the second half after the semicolon. Repent and believe in the gospel. That's what I want you to memorize here. Mark 1.15, repent and believe in the gospel. All right, so we're still talking about um, what we're praying for in the second petition. Lead holy lives, or believe God's word and lead holy lives. B, bring many others into his kingdom of grace. So in other words, now you might say, well, this is more than a twofold how, because we said, remember, what's twofold? Let's quick review. Hallowed be many a twofold how. When the word of God is taught in its truth and purity, and we lead holy lives according to it, your kingdom come, twofold how. That we believe God's word and lead holy lives according to it. You can add that. Now, you might think, well, wh what about this? Bring others into his kingdom of grace. Well, it's the same petition. It's just for someone else. That they would believe God's word and lead holy lives according to it. Okay? And then C, use us to extend his kingdom of grace so that others may believe his word and lead holy lives according to it. See how, so it's all, it's still the same twofold how. And then D, hasten the coming of his kingdom of glory. And this essentially is saying, so this is the, that, that last part of thy kingdom come. Yes, we are content because we should live in contentment, ninth and 10th commandments. We are content that we are in the kingdom of this world for now. We're living in this world, but we're not of this world. But yes, it is inherent to your kingdom come. And I think all Christians inherently know this, that we're also praying, come quickly, Lord Jesus, save us from this veil of tears. That is, I think, the obvious your kingdom come. But the, uh, the less obvious is that we might believe his word and lead holy lives according to it. And why I say less obvious is because I can guarantee you, everyone who thinks they're a Christian, or who knows they're a Christian, uh, whoever, everyone who knows there's a Christian, who, even who watching this video, we all assume that we believe God's word and we're doing our best to lead holy lives according to it. But we all have blind spots. And it is really hard for us when someone, a pastor, a parishioner, a loved one, says, well, you know, this is what God's word says, and you're not, you're not believing what God's word says. It's really hard for us, because of our pride, to admit, well, maybe I don't believe God's word the way I should. Maybe I'm not leading a holy life according to it in the way I should, according to God's word. So that's why I really focus on the your kingdom come. It's, it's, a, it's a petition of humility that we acknowledge that we have room to grow, that we may not know everything, and that certainly we aren't doing everything we're supposed to do. All right, twofold how, your kingdom come. We believe God's holy word, lead holy lives according to it. All right, uh, question 214, page 186. I know, video long, but I hope uh, it, this is so important because prayer is so important. It's a part of our life. Pray without ceasing, Paul says. Everything we should do should be done in prayer. Question 214, how can we be certain that the kingdom of God comes? The Lord guarantees that his means of grace establish and sustain his kingdom. Here we go. Here's the kingdom of grace. The means of grace establishes kingdom. So you want to be where the kingdom is? Go to church. Simple as that. 
You want on, in, on this side of glory, you want to be where God's kingdom is? Be in church on Sunday. Be on church on Wednesday. Be on church whenever you can get there. Don't think of it as a law that the pastor says, well, you know, we have church seven days a week. you got to be in church seven days a week. I mean, we shouldn't think of it that way. We should think of, here the kingdom of heaven is. That's where I want to be. And we need to learn to reprioritize our schedule to say, this is good. Church is good. And church is where the kingdom is. The kingdom of grace is. Which strengthens my faith in the coming of the, the kingdom of glory. That's, that's awaiting me when death comes. And I should not fear death, but embrace the fact that death is but a portal to life eternal. And the kingdom of grace is also where we confess that the, the Lord is the king of this universe. He is the Lord of the nations. So even when things are bad all around us here in this world, we have a place of respite and solitude. All right. Third petition, and then we'll be done for today. Now, I think this is going to be our longest video yet. But like I told you, we're kind of uh, squeezing a part of one class into this one. All right. Thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Your will be done on earth as in heaven. What does this mean? Let's read together. The good and gracious will of God is done even without our prayer, but we pray in this petition that it may be done among us also. Notice all three petitions. Hallowed be the name, your kingdom come, your will be done. All happen apart from our prayer. They happen automatically. God's going to do them anyway. We may, we're praying that it be personal in our lives. Same thing with thy will be done. So, twofold how. Remember we got three petitions, three twofold hows. How is God's will done? This one's a little hard to memorize. How will be the name was easy. We pray in this petition uh, that, that the word of God is taught in its truth and purity. We lead holy lives according to it. Your kingdom come. We believe God's word and lead holy lives according to it. This one's a little bit longer. When uh, So how is God's will done? God's will is done, underline these words. When he breaks and hinders every evil plan and purpose of the devil, the world, and our sinful nature. Underline all that. You can stop underlining at the comma. I'm going to keep reading. Which he, which, I'm oh, sorry, which do not want us to hallow God's name or let his kingdom come. So how is God's will done? First part. When he breaks and hinders every evil plan and purpose of the devil, the world, and our sinful nature. Because all three of those things, that's the unholy trinity right there. Remember when we learned it in the first article of the Creed? We said the unholy trinity was sin, death, and the power of the devil. Well, here it's slightly different order, and instead of saying death, it has the word world. And remember, death and world are basically synonymous, because this world is a world of death. Right? Unless Christ comes again first, everything on earth will die. That's horrible. We should be horrified by that. This is, this is an evil world. Death is not supposed to be the way it is. Everything, mosquitoes, even the things we don't like, are all going to die. Until Christ comes, until Christ comes again. So, uh, when how is God's will done? When He breaks and hinders every evil plan and purpose of the devil, the world, and our sinful nature, our sinful flesh, uh, which all three do not want us to keep God's name holy or let His kingdom come, because all three are trying to keep us from leading holy lives according to it and believing God's word. All three things are trying to keep us out of church, for example. And then here's the second part of the twofold how. And when he strengthens and confirms us in his word and faith until we die. Which is another way of saying, and we lead holy lives according to God's word. That we believe it and that we hold it fast. We hold it firm. So um, you could think of all three of these twofold hows. The second half is being, we lead holy lives according to it. If you said that, I wouldn't mark it wrong on your test. But you will be tested on these twofold hows. But what is, how, how is God's will done? When he breaks and hinders every evil plan and purpose of the world, the devil, and our flesh, and when he strengthens and keeps us firm in his word and faith until we die. So underline when he strengthens and keeps us firm in his word and faith. And you don't have to underline until we die. But think of that as um, lead holy lives according to it. That's, that's basically what we're doing. So, uh, almost an hour. What is the good and gracious will of God? It is God's will that his name be kept holy and that his kingdom come. That is, that his word be taught correctly and that sinners be brought to faith in Christ and lead uh, godly lives. So again, this is what we're talking about. All, the first two petitions are kind of building up to the third one. And the third one just looks back on the first two and shows us how the unholy trinity is kind of trying to keep God's name from being holy, trying to keep God's kingdom from coming, and trying to thwart God's will from being done. So this is why I teach this together, all three together, because they all kind of go together. All right. Uh, circle Bible, verse 753. 1 Thessalonians 4.3. 
For this is the will of God, your sanctification. You remember what sanctification is? Sanctification, it's an act of God making us holy. You wrote that on the front cover of your book. Act of God making us holy. Fruits of the Spirit are the works wrought by God's Spirit who dwells in believers. So, this is the will of God, your sanctification, that you would keep God's name holy, that you would let God's kingdom come into your life, that you would go where the kingdom of God is coming through the means of grace. This is all part of God's will. All right, question 216. Whose will and plans are opposed to the will of God? We already talked about this uh, already, but again, here's your unholy trinity. The devil, the world, and our sinful nature oppose the good and gracious will of God. Circle Bible verse 754. 1 Peter 5, 8. Be sober-minded, be watchful. Your adversary, the devil, prowls around like a roaring lion, seeking someone to devour. Devil's attribute. That's what I have in parentheses here. You don't have to write that down if you don't want to. But this is a wonderful verse to remind us of how the devil is always working. And he's always working uh, like a roaring lion, seeking someone to devour, but he prowls around. So so often what we would like is we would like the enemy to be clear and obvious. You know, we think of the Revolutionary War. The red coats are coming. You know, the Brit. The, it was easy to identify the Brits because they wore red coats. Right? It was easy to identify them. It's not so easy to identify somebody when they are trying to look like you. Think of the example of the wolf in sheep's clothing, for example. So the sa Satan would rather have himself look like one of us, right? And that's how he leads us astray. This is why I've talked about this before. When you've got these televangelists on TV that have you know, the, the wavy hair and the perfectly uh, toned skin, and they got that wonderful smile and that soothing voice. Oh, this sounds like someone I should be able to trust. And that's how the devil works, right? He's, he's a deceiver. He's the father of lies. He's a predator. He's like a lion prowling about, seeking someone to devour. When we went out, uh, this, oh man, I shouldn't go into these digressions, but if you ever go out west uh, and, and in your mountain lion country, uh, people always, you know, you, they're always, you're always worried about a mountain lion attack. But I remember when, we, when I went out there uh, with, my, with my wife and someone said, well, you know, the thing about a mountain lion attack is you're never going to know it's coming. They're, they're just going to be on you before, you know, it'll be, you're not going to see the lion from 100 yards off, you know, making his way towards you. Uh, if, he, if, if he's, if he's, you're never going to know. He's just going to be on you in no time. And that's terrifying, but on the other hand, it's kind of like, well, yeah, that's just the reality. So you might as well not live in fear. You just might as well be, just be prepared. Same thing with the devil. Sometimes we don't see him coming. We don't see his angles that he's working at. This is uh, screw tape Letters, if you ever read that by C.S. Lewis. Always showing how the devil's deceitful. He's always, this, he's, deception is always under the pretense of truth. It looks like it's true. That's what makes it deceitful. All right. Um, is that it? No, nope, almost done. All right, so question, flip the page, 188. Why do we pray that the will of God be done? We know that the will of God will always be done, but we want God's good and gracious will to be done in our lives. And here's a quote from the large catechism. As his name must be hallowed and his kingdom come whether we pray or not, so also his will must be done and succeed. This is true even though the devil with all his followers raise a great riot are angry and rage against it and try to exterminate the gospel completely. But for our own sakes, we must pray that, even against their fury, his will be done without hindrance among us also. We pray so that we may not be able to accomplish anything and that we may remain firm against all violence and persecution and submit to God's will. So submit, yeah, okay. Uh, Circle Bible verse 759. For to me to live is Christ and to die is gain. I don't know. I don't know how that. I don't remember why I have you circle that verse other than it's just a great verse. So while we live here on this life, we live uh, for Christ and in Christ. We try to keep these petitions. Where we try to we pray these petitions, try to lead holy lives according to them. Um, but at our death, that's where we have our gain. Okay. Question two one eight. How is God's will done in our lives? God's will is done. This is the twofold how. Uh, he breaks and hinders the plans of the devil, the world, and our sinful nature, which try to destroy our faith in Christ. B, he strengthens and keeps us firm in his word and faith and helps us lead God-pleasing lives. And C, he, C, he supports us in all our troubles until we die. Um, so yes, uh, I mean, I guess you could add that, that, that being a threefold how here. But again, this supports us in all our troubles until we die. We get that in, in other places too, uh, where, God, we, where we, we, we trust that God preserves us in the one true faith until life everlasting. Uh, we, we, we hear that at the blessing of the service of the sacrament after the distribution and the reception. Um, I think that's going to be it. Now, we're at an hour and four minutes. Uh, 
And what I'm going to do is I know next class is going to be um, shorter than this one because it's just one class instead of two. We are going, I know I said we were going to do our hymn. I didn't think it would be this long. 766, make sure uh, when we start singing that hymn that you don't just stop listening because I'm going to show you how all of these petitions, particularly these twofold hows, are taught in each verse of this hymn and why this hymn is just such a great thing to memorize. Um, it, it, yeah, so let, oh, I won't go any longer, but let's close with our prayers. Um, and uh, we will pray uh, Psalm 23. Let's do it together. The Lord is my shepherd, I shall not want. He makes me lie down in green pastures. He leads me beside still waters. He restores my soul. He leads me in paths of righteousness for his name's sake. Even though I walk through the valley of the shadow of death, I will fear no evil, for you are with me. Your rod and your staff, they comfort me. You prepare a table before me in the presence of my enemies. You anoint my head with oil, my cup overflows. Surely goodness and mercy shall follow me all the days of my life, and I shall dwell in the house of the Lord forever. Amen. And let's close with uh, Luther's uh, evening prayer. I thank thee, my heavenly Father, through Jesus Christ, your dear Son, that you have graciously kept me this day. And I pray that you would forgive me all my sins where I have done wrong and graciously keep me this night. For into your hands I commend myself, my body and soul and all things. Let your holy angel be with me, that the evil foe may have no power over me. Amen. All right, long video today, I know. But God be with you, Lord be with you, and I hope that this um, increases uh, your fervency uh, for your prayer life and also helps you understand exactly all that you are praying for in the Lord's Prayer. And this is why I think, and here's where I, I will say this, I would love it if in our churches, when we pray the Lord's Prayer, we would pray them very slowly, petition by petition. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come. Thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread. You know, I, I kind of messed up the, the thy will be done part. But you get the point, though. To have that pause, that we can think about all that we are actually praying for and petitioning. All right, with that said, uh, I would encourage you to pray the Lord's Prayer that way and think about each petition. And I look forward to the next study. Again, uh, just as a last, last 30 second thing. When I first uh, taught Lord's Prayer, this is the part that I dreaded teaching in catechism because I wasn't really sure how to teach it. But it's in part, and what I realize now is because I didn't know what it meant for myself. I didn't dig into it as deep as I, as I, do, as I do now. And I didn't realize the, the significance of all that's included in such short uh, little petitions. It is the perfect prayer. So pray it uh, without ceasing in all that you do. Uh, God be with you, and we'll look forward to seeing you next class.